Hi, my name is Gabriel Sanfira, and today I'm going to show you a demo of Coriolis, our cloud migration tool. Um, we are going to be migrating an, a virtual machine from VMware ESXi 6.7 to KubeVirt. I'm not going to go into too many details about Coriolis and its architecture. If you'd like, you can go to our website at cloudbase.it slash Coriolis. Here you'll find information about Coriolis itself, its architecture, how it works, what it is, and so on. For today, we're just going to focus on migrating one virtual machine from ESXi to KubeVirt using Coriolis. Now let's take a look at our environment. This is our VMware ESXi uh, host. We're just going to log into it. We have three virtual machines inside of it. We are going to be focusing on migrating CentOS 7, this CentOS 7 machine. Let's confirm that is in, it is indeed a CentOS 7 instance. Here we go, it is. Now, we're going to be migrating this VM without shutting it down and without disrupt disrupting it in any way. So this machine currently has an uptime of 11 days and it will stay that way while we migrate it, uh, replicate it, then migrate it to KubeVirt. So let me just write a quick file to it. Uh, echo. Hi there. We are migrating from VMware ESXi to KubeVirt. See you on the other side. pick a random name there we go so we have our file now it's time to do the actual migration and show you that on the other side you're gonna have a one-to-one -one copy of this instance including the file we just written here so let's log into Coriolis now the first thing we do after we log in is to create a few cloud endpoints a couple of cloud endpoints our source and destination in this case, uh, we're going to be focusing on VMware to KubeVirt. Uh, we have other options as well, but for today, we're just going to focus on these two. So let's add the VMware endpoint. Let's say ESXi. It's the, this is an arbitrary name. doesn't really matter. The username is root because we're using plain ESXi. We're not using vSphere here, although we could. They work all the same. Let's get the hostname or IP address of our instance of our ESXi uh, host, sorry. Here it is. We're gonna allow untrusted certificates because we're using a self-signed certificate generated automatically by VMware. We validate in this step, we make sure that we can log into the VMware uh, uh, hypervisor and uh, two basic operations uh, on, on that particular hypervisor. Now let's add a KubeVirt endpoint as well. Let's say we're running this on a, an, an, an Intel NUC, so the name is arbitrary, so we choose a file. Um, this is a plain kube config. There's nothing special about it. It's a Kubernetes cluster deploy via kube ADM with kubevirt on top. We validate and save. We make sure that kubevirt is installed in the, in the uh, Kubernetes deployment. And once we check if everything is fine, the endpoint is added and is now ready to be used. So time to add a replica. This is our disaster recovery as a service type of a migration. Uh, you also have the option to do plain migration as if you like, which is a one-off, but we're going to be focusing on the replica thing. Create, hit next. We choose our source that we added previously. Click next. Enable automatic uh, CBT. So this will make sure that change block tracking is enabled on the instance that we're migrating. And we are uh, running on a VMware uh, ESXi 6.7. This can be automatically uh, determined, but to skip that automatic, de automatic detection, we can explicitly set it. Let's choose our CentOS 7 instance. Now it's time to choose the destination provider. We're going to go with KubeVirt. This, these are the target options. So some aspects of this migration can be tweaked. 
before we we kick it off we can uh, give the cluster the our kubernetes uh, cluster name here this will be used to generate valid ssl certificates that coriolis needs to be able to communicate with its temporary workers uh, that facilitate the disk transfer between uh, source and destination so this disk sync image here is in fact a uh, simple um, uh, service that we wrote to facilitate in the, uh, the disk transfer from whatever cloud you're migrating from to kubefert. So it simply ingests the disk data from source to destination. The maximum memory per instance and maximum CPU cores per instance are, are basically caps to make sure that if you're migrating a huge instance, we don't overwhelm your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So, for example, if your cluster can handle uh, uh, for instances of four gigs with four CPU cores at the most, and you're trying to migrate an instance that has uh, 32 gigs of RAM and 32 cores allocated to it, we will obey this maximum cap. Of course, you can set it as high as you'd like. If your cluster can ingest huge instances, that sh that, that's perfectly fine. But this is just uh, a measure to make sure that that doesn't happen. We choose the namespace. Uh, we're going to go with the default one. This is the namespace where the instance will end up in the end. Click Next. This is the network mapping phase of the migration process. On the source, we are connected to VM network. Of course, on Kubernetes, we only have the one pod network, so we're just going to go with that. Uh, on any other cloud, you would be able to choose between as many networks uh, as you have cre uh, created inside your destination cloud and do a one-to-one -one mapping between source and destination networks. For storage, it's the same thing as for the networking. You're, uh, you have an option to map uh, source data stores to destination storage classes on, on uh, Kubernetes. And in this case, we only have one storage class. Let me show you real quick. Here we go. This is just the one storage class. If you would, uh, if we would have had more, uh, they would have shown up here. So once we select the storage class, we click Next. Schedules allow you to do periodic syncs of this particular instance. So Coriolis is able to keep, keep uh, your instance in sync. This is, like I said, the DR uh, implementation of uh, Coriolis. It, uh, it uses a cron-like system to run replicas at predetermined schedules. You can, of course, uh, configure it in such a way that it will create a new replica as soon as the uh, previous one just finished. Click Next, and this is a summary of our uh, replica, and we click Finish. I have Before we click Finish, I have to say that all of these operations can be scripted. We offer an API that you can use to be able to create all of this, uh, all of this content in just one API call. Let's click Finish, and uh, the replica should start shortly. And I'm going to sh be showing you on the destination what happens as it happens. So we're validating the source inputs, uh, connecting to VMware, looking for the instance that we're migrating and uh, getting information about it. We've just created a volume, new volume, to ingest the data from the source. On the source, we have a 16 gig disk. Uh, now on the destination, we have one of similar size. Now we deploy the temporary uh, resources. We need to do the disk sync, which is this particular uh, pod. This will ingest the disk from source to destination, and we only care about written blocks. So we're doing a CBT snapshot now, and as you can see, we have about 2 gigabytes of disk written uh, out of a total 16 gigabytes. So we're only transferring that 2 gigabytes worth of data from source to destination. And as you can see, uh, it's uh, really quite fast to do this. So we don't care about transferring empty space. We only care about transferring the actual content that that uh, the instance has written to disk. Now this should finish shortly. And it's done. It took roughly 30 something seconds, 34 seconds, I think. Uh, now we're deleting the replica source resources that this particular pod that we no longer need is going to get deleted. And as soon as that happens, the replica will be done. 
and it's gone. So now we have a one-to-one -one copy from source to destination. If we choose, if if we choose to, we can run it again, and if something changed on the source, it will automatically get replicated to the destination. In this case, Kubevert. Now it's worth mentioning that only the differences, only the deltas from the previous sync will get copied over to the destination. So uh, the, the transfer of data is as optimized as it can get. And this, can ha this happens because we're leveraging uh, VMware's change block tracking feature. Now, as soon as we have the replica in sync, we can choose to, like I said, execute it again or create a migration from replica. Let's do a migration so you see how that works. We click on migrate and let's view the status of that migration. Now in this phase of the migration, we validate uh, the deployment, the, the replica resources that we created re re uh, previously. We deploy the replica instance. We, for this, for this particular operation, uh, there is a stage called OS morphing. Now during this stage, we leverage a temporary worker in Kubevert, an, uh, an actual Kubevert instance, to morph the image, to modify the, uh, the, the disks of the instance that we're migrating to be able to run successfully on the destination. So we're migrating from, from VMware ESXi. Let me show you. So this is the temporary worker. It's a, if you're migrating a Linux instance, this will be a Linux um, worker. If you're migrating a Windows instance, you're, this will be a Windows uh, worker. Uh, now, we need to, we're migrating from VMware ESXi to KVM. So in some cases, we may need, for example, to remove um, OpenVM tools or uh, VMware tools on Windows. We need to install VirtIO drivers in the case of Windows or simply regenerate the init RD on Linux to include the virtual drivers, and of course include cloud init on, win on Linux and cloud base init on Windows to make sure that everything runs smoothly uh, once uh, the instance boots up on KVM in Kubevert. So here we see that we've detected the OS version. We removed the OpenVM tools from our instance that we're migrating. Um, now we're adding any necessary packages to make sure that the transition is smooth from source to destination, like cloud init, uh, cloud utils, and so on. This operation takes roughly two and a half minutes to three minutes. We should be... Oh, uh, by the way, this is the, the VM instance of the temporary worker. As you can see, this, it's the same IP address here. Now we're about halfway through. Once this is done, the temporary instance used to do the OS morphing will be terminated and removed. And this is all run in real time, so what you're watching is actually happening. should be done shortly. Now we're deleting the OS morphing resources, which means that this particular worker will be terminated soon and it's gone. Now we're actually deploying the final instance. You should see it, here we go. So it just popped up here. Let's get the VMI. It's still scheduling, but it should be done by the time we run this command. No, it's not. Here we go. So we've connected to the console of the instance that we've migrated from source to destination. and. Uh, the serial console is enabled automatically by Coriolis when we migrate the instance from the source. If it's not already enabled on the source, we enable it automatically so you get um, access to Grub as well as the uh, teletype terminals in, uh, in your instance. CentOS takes a little bit of time to boot for, uh, when you first migrated from, uh, from another environment, but you should be seeing it shortly. Here we go. 
So this is grub, as you can see, it works. Let's select the default entry. And we see cloud in it doing its thing. We should see a login prompt soon. And here we have it. Let's disconnect. We'd like this SSH into it. So let's get the IP address. And here we have it. And this is the file we wrote on ESXi. Let's just confirm. And here we go. The same content. And this instance is still running. So business continuity is in short. So thanks a lot. That's the demo. See you later.